Well, good morning, church. Uh, we have landed at chapter 7 of Luke uh, this morning. And uh, we're going to look, and I've entitled my message, From Doubts to Destiny. Have you ever been disappointed or upset with God? Have you, uh, when your prayers are not answered, when your expectations are not met, do you even become angry or bitter? Well, you are not the first. You won't be the last. The Bible records for us many instances where the people of God became angry with him. In the wilderness, when the Israelites did not get what they wanted, they grumbled, they complained. And they even threatened to return to Egypt. Ever done that? Lord, I've given so much in becoming a Christian, but my life don't seem to be improving. Maybe I should just return to my old life. Then there was Jonah. Shipwrecked, almost drowned, swallowed up by a sea monster, monster and spilled out. And finally relented and went to Nineveh and do what God wanted him to do. That is to preach to the people of Nineveh the message of repentance. He told them, repent. Turn from your wicked ways or else God will destroy all of you. Surprisingly, the people of Nineveh repented, turned from their wicked ways and so God blessed uh, them mightily. But Jonah got upset because God blessed these people. When God blessed someone ahead of you, someone who is of a different faith, of a different skin color, do you also become angry and upset? Because you think or you believe you are the more deserving one. You are the better one. Then there, there was David. When God became angry with God, when God struck down Uzzah for trying to steady the, the Ark of the Covenant. Have you ever had some, a loved one taken from you and therefore you are still angry like David and temporarily abandons the presence of God? Then there is John the Baptist, which is the subject of our text this morning. Come with me to chapter 7 from verse 18 to 21. Let me read this. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? When the man came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? John was in prison at this point in time. And he, has, he begins to doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. Like John the Baptist, we will all have doubts. That's a part of life. But please remember this. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is unbelief. Doubt comes 
when we don't have all the answers, when we don't see the complete picture of what God is doing in our life. So doubt is not a sin, but doubt is a tool that God will use to draw us, or rather the devil will use to draw us away from God. Or it can be a tool that will help us to seek for answers and in the process, draw us closer to God. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus, after preaching his greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he returned to Capernaum, where he healed a centurion's servant from afar. Then he made his way to Naim, where he raised from the dead the son of a widow. Deeds of what Jesus has done soon spread and reached the ears of John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist sent two of his disciples to Jesus and asked, are you the one who is to come or should we expect another? By this time, John the Baptist was in prison. He did what God wanted him to do. He confronted King Antipas about his relationship with his brother's wife. And so for that, he was thrown into prison. Like disciples of Jesus, he too would have believed that the coming Messiah, the Messiah would be a powerful individual that would deliver them from the oppression of the Romans and right what is wrong in Israel. At the very least, John would have thought, Jesus, shouldn't you have taken your cousin out of prison? But that did not happen. So John's expectations were not met. Because of this doubt, he asked Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should I expect somebody else? When we are in doubt, what do we do? First, look at who John the Baptist is. Yeah? Scripture records for us, while he was in his mother's womb, when his mother met Mary, John the Baptist slept in his mother's womb. He was an unborn baby who already knew who the Messiah is. He lived a simple life and he's a powerful preacher because he drew many into the wilderness which his message of repentance. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Then he was the one of, he was the voice in the wilderness shouting and proclaiming, prepare the way of the Lord, make a straight path for him. And one day when uh, John sees Jesus coming to him, John the Baptist declared, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist was the one who baptized Jesus who saw the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus like a dove and heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, whom I love. In him I am well pleased. Jesus himself said of John the Baptist, Of all those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. If John the Baptist can have doubts, what more, you and I? But more importantly, when doubts come, what do you do? Or what is it that has caused John to be put in such doubt? When John the Baptist was in doubt, what was his response? He did not ask the world. He did not ask his friends. 
he asked Jesus directly. So when we are in doubt, our first response must always be to ask Jesus. So when this question was asked to Jesus by two of his disciples, Jesus responded graciously. And he pointed to the disciples the miracles that he was doing as uh, his identity. He is telling the disciples to report to John that he is the fulfillment of scripture. That what they are seeing is the evidence of his identity. And he even went further. He began to quote scripture of who the Messiah is. He told them the, the blind sees, the lame walks, the lepers are healed. The deaf here, the dead raised, the good news preached to the poor. He affirmed to John with scripture of who he is. John, Jesus knew, John knows the scripture. John was raised uh, as a prophet. He is the son of a priest. So he knows the scripture. And Jesus is affirming to John by quoting scripture. He's pointing to scripture to John that he is the Messiah. Scripture will always take our attention away from our own troubles and focus it on what matters, the Son of God and the things of God. He is telling John the Baptist, I'm not the Messiah based on your personal expectation of how I will respond to every of your personal crises. Likewise, Jesus is telling us he is not the Messiah that will respond according to our expectations of him every time we get into a personal crisis. He is telling us whenever you face challenges, whenever you are in doubt, turn to the scriptures. There you will find your answer. And I want to anchor this properly with another passage of scripture taken uh, from Luke chapter 24. On the day of resurrection, amongst the first people uh, that encountered Jesus was Mary Magdalene, two women, and these two disciples that were on the way to Emmaus. Jesus joined their journey. And then, Scripture records for us here that the eyes of these two disciples were restrained. That means Jesus closed their eyes so that they did not know him. Why would Jesus close the eyes of these two disciples so that they did not know him? So he embedded himself in the conversation of these two disciples and after listening to the conversation, he asked them this question, why are you so sad? Jesus is giving us a hint as to how we are to get out of our sadness, how we are to get out of our disappointments, how we are to get out of our doubts and our misery. So the two disciples responded, haven't you heard what has happened in Jerusalem over the last few days? There is this Jesus of Nazareth. We thought he is the, the Messiah, but he was convicted, crucified, and buried. But we are more confused now because this morning, some, some women went to his tomb and his body was not found. So we are all confused. 
And Jesus responded, Oh, foolish one, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter his glory? The Bible records for us, foolishness is those who don't know the scriptures. So that's why Jesus says, foolish one. And the second indictment is even worse. That you know the scriptures, but by your action, you don't believe. Or that you are slow to believe. And so, Jesus then went on and told them to, and beginning at Moses. What's beginning of Moses? The five uh, uh, books of, the, the first five books of the Bible, yeah? The Pentateuch. And all the prophets, that means from Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the way to Zechariah and uh, Malachi. Meaning the entire of the Bible. That's the only the Old Testament when Jesus was around. Yeah? He expounded to them the whole Bible in all the scriptures, the things concerning riches and prosperity, what to do or what not to do. No, he expounded to them the things concerning himself. He's telling us every time you read the Bible, you must see Jesus. Every time you attend Bible classes, whether it's PUP, BSF, our own discipleship journey, you must see Jesus. It is in Jesus that you will find the answer. When you are in doubt, look to the scriptures. Find Jesus in it. That will be your answer. And then what happened? When Jesus expounded to them the scriptures, Bible records for us, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? That means your heart is so warm. So touched because the Holy Spirit has touched it. While he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. When Jesus opened the scriptures to us, it is for us to see him and him alone in the Bible. And with this one verse, Jesus now opened our eyes as to why he shut the eyes of these two disciples. He wants to give us exactly the same opportunity as these two disciples have. He wants the disciples throughout the generations to come and before to see him in the Bible. All of us have the same opportunity as all disciples throughout the ages, and that is to see Jesus in the Bible and in the Bible alone. He did not want us to then say or complain, I want to be like the disciples of those days who saw Jesus physically in the flesh. No, all of us, our opportunity is to see Jesus in the Bible. That's where you will find your answer. I've always said uh, often that if you want to understand uh, the significance of a Hebrew word, we must then look at its component alphabets and words. So scripture or the word of God in Hebrew is the word debar. And in debar, there are three alphabets. Dalit, Beth, and Rash, reading from right to left. Yeah. Dalit is a picture of a door. Beth, Rash forms the word son, S-O-N. It's uh, the word bar, which means son. So what is scripture? Door to the son. 
The Bible testifies about Jesus. The scripture points to Jesus. The Bible focuses our mind on Jesus. Every time we look to scriptures, we must see Jesus. Jesus himself declared this. You study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. Yes, eternal life. We will find it in the Bible. And, but this very scripture speaks about me. Eternal life is found in Jesus through us understanding scriptures that points to Jesus. Every time we see Jesus in the Bible, that's eternal life for all of us. Look to the scriptures. That's what the Bible is saying. And then Jesus went on to tell John this. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So are you offended when your prayers are not answered, when your expectations are not met? Or do you fall away from Jesus because of that? The life of John the Baptist is a testimony to all of us that a life in Christ is not all wine and roses blue skies and everything nice. There will be challenges. Yep. Because Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, heart, I have overcome the world. Meaning, yes, we will all have a journey of challenges in our life. But the promise of Jesus is that he will walk with you. And through this journey that you take with him over your challenges, he will grow you, he will shape you, he will mold you to be more and more like him. And so, Jesus is more interested in your holiness than your happiness. He is more concerned with your character rather than your comfort. And then Jesus went on to say this to John. I tell you, you know, John never made it out of prison. He was beheaded as a birthday gift uh, to King uh, Antipas' stepdaughter. But in spite of that, Jesus have this to say of John. I tell you, among all those born of women, there is no greater than John the Baptist. Why is John the greatest of all the prophets? All the other prophets prophesy of the coming of the Messiah, but none saw it come to pass. John was chosen to introduce Jesus to the world. He saw the unfolding of the Messiah before his very eyes. And that's why he was the greatest of all the prophets. But more amazing is the statement that followed. And it's the word of Jesus. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Imagine this. He is saying, you and I are greater than John the Baptist. Why so? John saw the beginning of Jesus' ministry. You and I have experienced the fullness of the finished work of Jesus on Calvary. That's why even the least among of us is greater than even John the Baptist. That's why our position in Jesus, so precious, so privileged, that we are greater than even the 
greatest of all the prophets. But a few of us may not even be aware and therefore do not appreciate all that is already ours. All of the love and forgiveness that has been poured out into our lives. In West Texas, there is a very well-known oil field known as the Yates Pool. During the Great Depression years of the 1930s, this uh, oil field was actually a ranch owned by a person called Ira Yates Jr. Because it was the Great Depression years, this ranch hardly generates any cash, uh, cash flow. And so, Mr. Yates uh, was at risk of losing this ranch because he was unable uh, to meet the mortgage payments of this ranch. Because there was so little money left, he and his family has actually been reduced to relying on government handouts and food stamps for their survival. One day out at the ranch, well, wondering how he will ever be able to pay off his debts, he saw a seismographic team from an oil company coming to his neighbor's ranch to drill for oil. They told him that there is likely to be oil on his ranch as well, and they requested for permission to sink uh, a cat well. He agreed. At 1,115 feet, they struck oil. The first well came in at 80,000 barrels a day. Subsequent well was much higher. One of his wells, the Yates, 90, uh, the Yates 30A, still holds the current world record at 204,000 barrels a day. And Mr. Yates owned it all. He was already very rich. He was a multi-billionaire, our time, multi-millionaire then, but was relying on government handouts and food stamps for survival. The problem, he did not know what he has or what he owned. It was already his, but he did not know it. The wealth was literally under his feet, but he was clueless. Jesus came to give us life and life abundantly. But like Mr. Yates, we may not even aware of our own heritage, what is already ours. And we end up like Simon the Pharisee, the subject of our next portion of Scripture, taken from uh, verse 36 to 50. Simon the Pharisee has Jesus sitting right in front of him. But he too was clueless. He was relying on his own strength. He was relying on his own righteousness to live out this life. Compare that with the other personality, an unnamed woman of ill repute, probably a prostitute, who knew and knew that her only hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. The response of these two persons is, should be a lesson for all of us. And so let me summarize this passage for all of you. Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus to his home for dinner. Like all cultures, there are certain common courtesies that you would extend to your guests. In Jesus' time, it was that when they come in, you would wash their feet. 
because they would have been walking on dirt road outside. So when they come in, you wash their feet. They would give the guests a kiss of greetings. And they would put a perfume oil, anointing or oil on the head so that the guest is refreshed. Simon offered none of this to Jesus. But compare what the woman did. Simon did not wash Jesus' feet. The woman washed Jesus' feet with her tears and wiped it dry with her hair. Simon did not give Jesus a kiss for greeting. The women kissed Jesus' feet. Simon did not anoint Jesus' head with oil. The women brought a whole alabaster jar. Jesus understood the actions of Simon was to reduce his social standing amongst the people present. Well, the women honored Jesus. So Jesus told Simon, Simon, I want to tell you a story. And thus Jesus shared the parable of the two debtors. Two men owned a money lender uh, money. One was for 50 denarii, which is approximately one and a half month of wages in those days, and the other owed him 500 denarii, which is about one and a half years of wages. Both were not able to pay their debt, and so the money lender forgave both of them the debt. And so Jesus asked Simon, who do you think will love the money lender more? Simon replied, Correctly, I suppose it's the one that was forgiven much more. That is the principle that we need to be very aware of. Those who know that they are forgiven much will love much. We are all forgiven much. It's only a question whether we realize that we are forgiven much or not. Scripture is very clear. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of this sin is death. Yeah, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We are all forgiven much. There is no such thing as being forgiven. We just need a little forgiveness. If we need only a little forgiveness, Jesus need not have come. He needs to come to take our place of death because we need much forgiveness. And if we love Jesus little, it is because we know little of the love and the forgiveness that is already poured out onto our life. If we love little, we will end up doing little. We will do the minimum. But if we know we have been forgiven much, our response will be like this unnamed woman who overflows with worship unto Jesus. Let's take a lesson from these women for all of us as to how to live a life in Jesus in worship. Firstly, our worship should not be easily hindered. There were many things that hindered this woman from coming to encounter Jesus. She was uninvited. She was unwelcome. She will be ridiculed. She will be scorned. 
the most hurtful of words will be spoken about her. But none of that hindered her from coming into the presence of Jesus. Unlike some of us, when we have a late Saturday night party, when it drizzles a little on a Sunday morning, we find it convenient to attend Sunday service. Worship, secondly, worship takes place at the feet of Jesus. When this woman stepped in, she straight fell at the feet of Jesus. In this short passage of Scripture, six times is the word mentioned, at the feet, at the feet, at the feet, at the feet, at the feet of Jesus. When Apostle Peter realized who Jesus was, that he is Lord and God, Apostle Peter fell at the feet of Jesus and told Jesus, depart from me, for I am a wicked man, for I am an unclean man, a sinful man. Up in heaven, every time, the Lamb of God is mentioned. All the saints, all the angels, the four living creatures, the 24 elders fell and worshipped Jesus. The proper position for worship is at the feet of Jesus. Three, worship is preoccupation with the person of Jesus. From the moment this woman stepped in, her one focus, her one attention was on Jesus and Jesus alone. There were many distractions that were around her. There were probably all sorts of words being ill-spoken about her. But her one concern was ministering to Jesus alone. Her one focus, her one attention was what? Jesus thought of her. Her entire preoccupation is on the person of Jesus Christ. Worship is not only about receiving, but giving to Jesus. In the Bible, it records for us, you know, many of Jesus' followers followed him because they were looking to receive blessings and healing. And that's nothing wrong with that. Yeah? But a disciple's worship is actually in giving to Jesus. Far too often, our worship and our praise consists of a wish list. Far too seldom, it's, a, it's our worship about giving Jesus his rightful place, the place that is above all other places. Far too seldom is, is it about coming into the presence of Jesus and hearing from Jesus in terms of showing our adoration and praise to, to the one who gave it all for us. Worship involves the emotions. The passage, if you read it, you know this woman poured out her emotions to all that was there. She was comfortable in that. For many of us, our worship often is cerebral. Yeah? We are very prim and proper. You know, we are very mindful of our, who we are. But the Bible tells us the greatest of the commandments to us is to love your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your mind. And therefore, it involves the emotions 
So we are all wired differently. So it is all right for any of you to show your emotions during worship, during altar time to God. And so for the rest of us, particularly the men, please don't say, that one is a drama queen. <laughs> it involves our emotion. Lastly, worship requires action, not just words. The entire passage, the woman's act was all her action. There was not a single word recorded that the woman has spoken. I suspect she did not even say a single word. The Bible never records a single word of what this woman said. All it tells us is her actions, what she has done, and her level of worship. As I read this, then it occurred to me too that there are many people in our church who come to serve week in, week out, without being hurt, without saying a word, without being seen. So this morning in particular, I want to acknowledge all those who are come to serve our Lord Jesus and you think you are not noticed, the Lord notice you and we want to express our full gratitude and thanksgiving to all of you. So I want to thank Payman, your council team, all those up in the control room, all our yeah, all our uh, uh, traffic wardens, yeah, everyone, I can't name them all, but thank you very much for all that you have done, yeah. Yeah, it affirmed to us everything you do has worth, yeah, because you serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. After she had done all this, Jesus then said to the women, your faith has saved you. Jesus is affirming to you and I that it is our faith, our belief that saves us. It's not our works. We are saved by faith, not by works. The works of these women is a manifestation of her faith. Because of her faith, she is able to serve Jesus the way she served. And Jesus also told her, go in peace. Simon the Pharisee, of course, uh, is a Jew. And so this would be a Jewish household. And Jesus then would have spoken to the woman in Hebrew. Go in peace. In Hebrew, is lehu, bashalom. Uh, the root word, bashalom, comes from the word shalom. And in shalom, in Hebrew, it means not only peace, it means harmony, it means tranquility, it means fullness, wholeness, completeness, welfare, well-being, and prosperity. Jesus is telling these women, go in peace. Go in all that God intends for you. Go into the fullness that God wants for you. Go into your prophetic destiny. And this morning, the prayer and the hope of our church as well is that each and every one of you will also go into the fullness of the prophetic destiny that God has for each and every one of you. God himself declared this. For I know the plans I have for you. Declares who? Declares the Lord. He knows he has the plan for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give each and every one of you a hope and a future. So flow into the fullness of God's plans. God's purpose and God's prophetic destiny for your life. Let me conclude with a story. Many years ago, 
there was an old man who together with his son has a love for the arts. And so they would travel the world and acquire all the uh, precious art pieces that were available for sale. And so in his estate, there were works of Rembrandt, Van Gogh, uh, Picasso, and many others. One day, during, it was during the Second World War, uh, in 1943, his son left to serve in the, arm, uh, in the army. You know? And so, but six months later, the old man received a telegram. His worst fears was confirmed. His son was killed while carrying a fellow soldier to safety. Distraught and in pain, the old man knew that the joy that so filled his home will visit him no more. One day he heard a knock on the door and as he opened the door, he saw a young soldier carrying a big package under his arm who introduced himself this way. Sir, I am the soldier your son saved when he was killed. The old man quickly invited the young soldier into uh, his home as, as they shared. The young soldier told the father, the old man, that his son not only saved him, but quite a few others as well. He shared about how the son would share about their love for art and their travel, you know. And he told the old man, Sir, I am an artist myself and I have sketched this picture of your son for you. So he handed the parcel to the old man who unwrapped it and saw, of course, a, a pencil sketch of his son. This picture, of course, would not make uh, any piece in any museum, but it shows clearly the features of the old man's son. Overcome with emotion, he told the young man, I will put this you know, in a prominent place. Thank you very much. In the months that followed, other soldiers that have been saved came to pay their respect to the old man. The pain, the anguish, the loneliness of the old man was soon replaced by fatherly pride. And he told his neighbour, you know, uh, this picture is now my favourite. I have now put it, you know, at my pride of place, which is above the fireplace. Years later, the old man died. And the day soon came where his estate, particularly all his artworks, was put up for auction. Museums and art lovers from around the world gather as his estate to bid for some of the best pieces that are available in the market. Dreams will be made that day. The auctioner starts the auction with the picture of the sun. Say, who will give me a hundred dollars for this sketch? The room went silent. Not a single hand was raised. After an embarrassing long silence, one person stood up and said, Sir, why don't we move on? None of us here came to bid for this old man's son's photo. Why don't we get to the rest of the other's paintings? But the auctioner was insistent. This picture must go first. More silence. After a long while, the old gardener of the estate raised his hand you know, and said, Sir, would you accept $10? That's all I have. I know this boy. He's good and filial son. Therefore, I want to keep 
his picture for myself. So the auctioneer announced, who will give me more than $10? Not a single hand was raised. Going once, going twice, gone to the gentleman at the back. Excitement quickly filled the room as everyone readies himself now to bid for all the masterpieces that is available. Then the auctioner announced, this auction is over. Stunned disbelief filled the entire room. One person quickly stood up and asked, what do you mean this auction is over? We did not travel halfway around the world to come to this place and bid for the picture uh, of uh, the old man's son. What about all these masterpieces lying around here? What about it? And the auctioneer replied, It is very simple, sir. According to the feel of the father, whoever takes the son gets it all. Likewise, the heavenly father who saw his son left heaven and come to earth to give his life so that many has saved, has also decreed this morning once again, whoever takes the son gets it all. I know probably a few of you has been here the last few times. The moment you stepped in, when the word of God is preached, your heart is so warm like the two disciples because you sense God is speaking to you. Today you know and you know God is speaking to you again. He's even knocking at the doors of your heart and he's asking whether you will also take his son. Will you also receive his son as your Lord and your Saviour? If there is any one of you here and you know God has spoken to you this morning and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, could you just lift up your hand quickly so that we can just pray with you and for you? Is there anyone at all? Anyone on this side? Anyone at all here? Anyone out in the balcony who wants to receive Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? Anyone at all? Okay, I don't see any hand. So I now want to address another group of people. Over the last few years, because of COVID, things have been extremely, extremely difficult for you. You don't seem to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But you have been faithful to God. You have been following Him all this while. And this morning, we want to open the altar for you so that we can now pray with you and for you, you know, so that indeed that God's purpose, you will be guided by God's purpose for each and every one of you. I just want to affirm you that even as the Word of God is preached, it will, I told him, not, he's got a lot of goals this morning, but it has to lodge in your spirit, man, understand, in order for it to be effective. Because it will be just water on a duck's back if you just not receive it. The reason why I come up this morning is to, is to encourage you that somewhere in this message, it has affected you. Doubts have come in. 
disappointments. In the last six months or thereabouts, something has happened to your family, to your finances, to your work, to your career, to relationships, even your health. But even as you begin to receive the word, in order for the word to work, in order for the word to become flesh, you have to appropriate it by faith. So I'm going to open the altar. If you had doubts, disappointments, you see, in the last two weeks was very significant for me. I visited two people in hospitals, one in Subang, one in Ish UKM in Charas. One had four arteries all blocked, you know. Even the private hospital surgeon dare not do work. I visited him, prayed for the wife. And within days, they got appointment to see the best surgeon in IJN who operated on him. And today, he's discharged. The other one had cancer of, not cancer, had a tumour of the pancreas. I don't know whether it's cancerous or not. But the good news, it was operable. And the surgeon, two surgeons in issue KM did the operation eight hours. Good news, she is now discharged. Now, why I share this? Isn't it amazing? When I visited them, did doubts come in? Probably, but they had faith. I saw their eyes. They had faith in God. And God honored them. That's why the altar is open. Do you have faith? faith in your situation you can walk out good message elder no point so I'm going to ask the invitation whatever your circumstances may be now your family, your finances, your work your health, doesn't matter if you have faith you trust God you allow Him to come into your circumstances and work a miracle. Understand? That's the best way I can put it. Father, thank you for your promise, Lord, that it is you who know the plans you have for us, Lord. Plans to prosper us, never to harm us. Plans to give us a hope and a future, Lord. Thank you, Rabbi Father, that you will guide and lead each and every one of us here, Lord, into the fullness of your plans, your purpose, and your prophetic destiny for our individual lives, Lord. And Lord, as you part, part us now, we pray, Lord, that the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with us today and every day of our lives, Lord. We give thanks and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Thank you everyone for being here. Service is over. For all those newcomers, please do not leave uh, without joining us for a time of fellowship. Please step one floor down in our hospitality lounge we will be delighted to pass a little gift to you and also to connect with you